Welcome everybody uh, to our Future Tense Convergence Lab event today on tweeting, tweeting diplomatically. Uh, my name is Andres Martinez. <laughs> I am the editorial director of Future Tense and I'm also uh, an advisor to President Michael Crow at Arizona State University and I am a professor of practice at our Cronkite School of Journalism. Bienvenidos a todos a nuestro evento de Future Tense Convergence Lab. Estamos muy agradecidos que estén con nosotros y con nuestro distinguido eh, panel hoy con los dos embajadores. Este evento, la charla será en inglés, pero tenemos una modalidad donde eh, se puede escuchar eh, la interpretación en otro link de Zoom que les hemos compartido y que va a estar también el link en el, en el Q&A abajo por si, por si lo quieren escuchar en español. Um, so actually, most appropriate to today's uh, conversation, I should also mention that I am a proud mutt. I'm a product of the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Uh, my mother from Dallas, Texas, went to Mexico City to teach the American school, uh, met my Mexican father at, at Sanborns, as one does. And so I had the privilege of being born in Mexico City um, and to grow up in, in Chihuahua. And so this, this is a very... Uh, triply exciting uh, conversation event uh, for, for me to be able to be part of and, and to host. Um, the, the Future Tense, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a project of Arizona State University, New America, a think tank in DC and Slate Magazine. We look at the impact of uh, technology on society. Convergence Lab is a set of activities that Mia Armstrong has, has been coordinating uh, to engage more with Mexico on the part of the university at Arizona State University at ASU. Um, we have some, uh, a broader team of people that are helping to connect the university more with Mexico. Um, I have to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, Dr. Rafael Rangel Sosman, who's been instrumental in a lot of these efforts and our colleague, uh, Paula Garcia in the president's office. Um, even in this time uh, where we've, we've been less connected personally than, than normal, we have been redoubling efforts to be more engaged with Mexico, which is, really core to our charter and mission as a university that wants to be relevant to our community in Arizona. We can't do that if we're not more engaged uh, in cross-border research activities and other such activities to uh, tackle shared challenges and, and avail ourselves of shared opportunities. Um, so that, that video was, was a, a way of introducing our, our university um, uh, and also, you know, one of the themes of that piece of propaganda is innovation, which is very relevant to today's discussion because both ambassadors, uh, Barcena and Landau, are day-to-day -day innovating diplomacy uh, using these new tools that we have to communicate. Um, I've always, uh, I, I can remember uh, a long time ago in my college days uh, studying George Kennan's long telegram. You know, one of the most consequential uh, diplomatic uh, messages ever sent, you know, and it was an 8,000 word telegram. So nowadays, I guess he could have, he could have opened a thread on Twitter for that, for that consequential, it would have, it would have been a long uh, thread. But I'm fascinated and eager to hear more about the complexity of, of your jobs as ambassadors representing, you represent a people, you represent a nation, you represent a particular an administration and, and a particular leader and now you're you're navigating those roles uh, and and communicating with audiences in real time different layers of audiences on social media that just must make uh, the job so different than what it was and 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 the, the balancing of those roles in real time a fascinating thing to watch I also would say that in the case of the two of you I have seen in addition to representing all of that, you seem to be representing a, a personal passion because you both seem very invested uh, in this relationship. Um, it's a complex relationship as everybody who's watching us knows. Um, the US and Mexico are, are so close. Um, the relation, you know, it's the, the commercial, whether you're looking at questions of, of commerce, migration, security, it is an amazingly close relationship, but it also can be fraught with, with uh, misunderstandings, historical, you know, resentments, suspicions. So being an ambassador in that bilateral relationship must be sort of like being, I mean, imagine being an ambassador to one of your siblings, right? That, that would be in some ways easy, in some ways like really complicated. Um, 
uh, given given all the history. And we've, you know, we've. I was thinking in advance of this that we've really been blessed with some very dedicated, competent uh, ambassadors, both in Washington and in Mexico City, mm -hmm. as far back as I can remember. Um, <clears throat> The, I'm also on the board of the U.S.-Mexico Foundation. We recently had a convocation with the previous ambassadors. That was a reminder of the caliber of people who, who've been in these positions. So, so uh, you all are following in their in their footsteps and and taking this to a, to a different level. Um, just very quickly, uh, I, I don't want to do very long introductions of your bios. People have access to them, and we could spend a lot of time going through your your incredibly uh, distinguished careers. But Marta. Barcena Coqui is the ambassador of Mexico in Washington. Uh, she has been in this role since December of 2018, I believe. She's had a long distinguished career as a diplomat. She entered the Mexican uh, Foreign Service in 1979. She's, she's served as ambassador in Denmark and Turkey and many other places. And at the multilateral level, she has represented Mexico at the UN, UNESCO, the OAS. She was also reminding us uh, as we were chatting, getting onto the Zoom, that she studied communications at, at the Ibero in Mexico City. So uh, welcome, Ambassador. And, and her counterpart in Mexico City is Christopher Landau, who was born in, in Madrid uh, and has had, he's been serving as US Ambassador in Mexico since August of 2019. Uh, he has uh, had a 30 year Yearish, I guess, uh, career as a as one of the more prominent appellate attorneys in in Washington D.C. Uh, he's argued nine cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, he clerked for Justices Scalia and Thomas. Um, I have to say, I spent a very short period of time in one of these very stodgy uh, D.C. law firms in another lifetime, and. Um, People in those firms are like incredibly smart, but not necessarily encouraged to be very uh, flamboyant in their communications uh, or have very creative Twitter accounts. So I'm really eager to hear about that transition, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Maybe part of this is you felt you felt liberated from the strictures of, of those law firms. Um, lastly, uh, I want to just uh, speaking of people who embody this relationship, Mia Armstrong. I want to introduce, as I mentioned, she's the coordinator of our. Convergence Lab activities. Mia is from Flagstaff, Arizona. And for those of you who are not familiar with our state, Flagstaff is not what you think of when you think of it of Arizona. It's, it's kind of in the northern part of the state, uh, more like Colorado. It's really cold, high altitude, people ski. Um, they chop down trees to burn wood to keep warm. So it's, it's not the Arizona that, that we think of in Phoenix. And despite growing up in that environment, Mia got very interested in, in, the, in the world and, and well, in Mexico in particular and um, came to Arizona State University, was one of our rock star students, uh, double majoring uh, in the Honors College in Global Studies and at our Cronkite School of Journalism, spent a semester at the Tec de Monterrey uh, in, in her junior year. She, she was there for the, for the unfortunate uh, tragic earthquake. Um, also won a national competition uh, that the New York Times has where she then became the sidekick to, to Nick Kristoff to do reporting on global development issues, and then uh, got a Fulbright to go to Mexico and was in Campeche uh, for the year uh, up until March, and sadly when the State Department advised her to, that she might wanna come back. And now she is back at her alma mater, not paying tuition, but, but getting a paycheck. Um, I hope we're paying you, but she is uh, really invested in this bilateral relationship. And it's, it's my honor to pass the baton, the moderating baton to Mia. Before we do so, we wanna have one, we wanna ask uh, our audience a poll question um, and then I'll hand it off. Let's see, so we're gonna launch this poll. The question is for those of you on social media, do you currently follow both an ambassador and an embassy account? only an embassy account, only an ambassador account, or neither. So this is sort of to set some, some sort of like to get, uh, get a sense of, of what people are, are following. Uh, so give you a couple of minutes and... We can't vote, that's not fair. I feel disenfranchised. You're disenfranchised, yes, I did not. <laughs> So if only you knew some lawyers in DC that they could represent you for that. <laughs> so here are the results. Uh, I'm going to share the results. Uh, 
So this was a very diplomatically attuned uh, audience. And so uh, I guess that accounts for, for the great interest. Uh, the vast majority of you, of you follow both an ambassador and an embassy account. Um, okay, Mia, I'm gonna pass this off to you. I think our goal has to be to get this 18% who follows yeah. neither to follow both by the end of yes. this conversation. We're, yes, we're gonna keep you here until you 18%. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that's the challenge. Um, but we thought it would be a good and interesting uh, way to kind of start the conversation because um, each of you actually has more followers on your Twitter account than your respective embassies accounts, which is not at all a reflection of the embassy accounts, but I think is more a reflection of kind of this market for personalized, humanized, uh, digital diplomacy that each of you um, have embraced. And I mean, at the same time, Twitter is, is certainly a bubble. Perhaps it's a larger bubble uh, than the Mexico City or, or DC foreign policy bubbles that uh, you might otherwise find yourselves in. But there are these larger questions about how to translate online activity into, into offline impact. So um, we clearly have a lot to get into today, but um, before we get to some of those bigger subjects, we actually um, wanted to kind of break the ice here with a quick round of rapid fire questions. Um, so the goal here is that um, you'll answer the questions in no more than a sentence, hopefully maybe only a word in some case, and we'll switch off who goes first so that um, there's, there's fairness here. Um, so, Ambassador Barsena, I'd actually like to start with you. When did you first start using Twitter? Uh, when I was ambassador to Denmark. Okay, and what year would that be, more or less? It would be around 2006, around. Right, and you, Ambassador Landa? Around the time that President Trump took office in January 2017. Okay, great. And Ambassador Landa, how many hours a day would you say you spend on Twitter? It really varies uh, a lot from day to day. I would say probably on average an hour to an hour and a half. Great. And Ambassador Marcena? Uh, I think about an hour or, or two hours, not, not more than two hours a day. Okay, great. And what would you say, um, Ambassador Marcena, are the best and worst parts of Twitter for you? I think the best is the possibility of having almost instant information and the, um, the possibility of sending your message uh, very fast. And the worst is all the disinformation and the polarization of Twitter and all the bots insulting other people. Sure. And you, Ambassador Landa? Pretty similar uh, response. I think the best is I think being able to interact with people that you'd never get a chance to meet face to face uh, and a very diverse group of people uh, all over Mexico and, and beyond. Uh, and the worst is you get uh, insults and, and uh, you know, some very uh, negative comments sometimes. So you have to have thick skin. Sure. So um, now we're going to pry you both for, for some recommendations. And I, I'm wondering, um, Ambassador Landau, who is, who is someone you follow on Twitter just for fun? Your favorite fun Twitter follower, maybe someone that isn't related to your work, but gives you a laugh or, or someone interesting? Who would you recommend we follow? That's a good question. I mean, I, I actually follow almost all uh, official accounts and news accounts. I, I've limited myself to a hundred people that I'm following on Twitter. You know, when you're having an official account, you have to be a little bit careful not just to follow people on a whim because then you never know if this person is controversial in some way. So uh, I actually don't follow that many people on Twitter that are just kind of uh, fun or fanciful. I, I should, I'm very interested to hear what Martha says. Maybe I can add some. Okay. Some Ambassador Barsana, who would you recommend to, to Ambassador Landau and the rest of us? I follow many more people, like more than 1,000. It's not that I follow them uh, often. But you know, um, one thing that I like to follow because of, of, of my, my studies is um, uh, and, and what I've done in my life is I follow accounts that are related to classical ballet. Okay. 
well. so, uh, because I was a dancer. So I love to see what's going on in the ballet world and what would be, you know, now in the digital time, like when is the Royal Ballet coming back, the American Ballet Theater. So that is the part of Twitter that uh, I enjoy to relax. Okay, okay. And, and I, I love that. And so, so speaking of relaxation, um, you know, maybe after a long day, at the embassy or the work from home embassy. I'm, I'm wondering what is your favorite option that you've found Ambassador Barsena for comfort food in DC? What do you order for dinner after a long day? Uh, my best comfort food here are, uh, for dinner are quesadillas. Okay, from what, what, what sort of quesadillas? It's a uh, uh, corn tortilla and, and, uh, and a cheese that is made that we buy here from uh, Mexican shops or this. So that kind of comfort food for me, it's perfect at evening. I try to eat a heavy lunch and a very light dinner. So okay. just some quesadillas is fine. Very Mexican. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and what about you, Ambassador Landa? What, what comfort food have you found in Mexico City after a long Pizza day? Pizza is my ultimate comfort food. Okay. Right. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you um, both for, for indulging us in that, that quick rapid fire round. And, and now to kind of dig into to some of these topics a little bit more. Um, Ambassador Barcena, you have served in the Mexican Foreign Service since 1979. And I'm wondering, you know, if you can take us back um, to when you first decided to use Twitter um, when you were serving as ambassador to Denmark, you mentioned kind of why you decided to do so and how you've seen social media um, kind of change the field of diplomacy in your years of service? I must say that I was very reluctant to use social media as an ambassador. And uh, I think I joined in Denmark and then I withdraw and then I joined again while I was ambassador to Turkey. And I have very, very few followers in comparison of what I have now. Um, I was very reluctant because I was formed in the traditional ways of diplomacy, like Diplomacy has to be discreet. Diplomacy has to, uh, you know, you have to be very careful on what you tweet about or what you write. And, and I'm also a very private person. Uh, so I don't like to tweet very much about my personal life or my private life. And, uh, but then uh, just acknowledging that public diplomacy was uh, more and more important then you realize that you have to use social media. So uh, in the use of social media, the overarching goal has been to try to paint a broader picture of Mexico and the Mexicans in all the countries that I have been posted to, uh, but particularly here in the US and try to uh, make very relevant on how Mexicans are important to the US and Mexico. Um, so sometimes I use several hashtags that I repeat in some of my Twitters. One of them is building bridges. The other one is together we are better. I don't think they have really fly a lot, but it, it ha they have sent a message. And the other thing is that we distinguish, and I distinguish at the embassies with which kind of social media I use. So for example, for my messages, I basically use uh, Twitter. For, for a more political outlook in which I also retweet the messages from the Mexican government, the foreign minister, the foreign ministry. In Instagram, we, we use Instagram and the most successful Instagram account can, has been for the Mexican Cultural Institute. It has a younger follower, uh, kind of followers, and it, is, it uses more much image. And to, uh, and to interact with the Mexican community is Facebook. The Mexican community really follows Facebook and it is, and they follow basically the account of the Mexican embassy, not my personal account. So we try also to select the messages that we are sending through different social media. Right. Well, thank you so much for that. And, and Ambassador Lando, you've clearly had a, a, a bit of a different trajectory as, as we spoke about. And so, um, you know, I want, I'm wondering if you can take us into, you know, when you first started uh, using Twitter, kind of why you decided to do so and how you were doing so. And then, you know, when you go into your office in, in Mexico City in August of 2019, how were you thinking about social media and, um, and how has that changed? I mean, I know you inherited an account that had about 40,000 followers and you've grown it to more than 265,000 now, I think. So if you choose to share your secret to gaining followers, I'm sure we'd all be, uh, be open to that as well. But I, I want you to take us into your journey a little bit there. Sure. I really 
as Andres said, you know, as a lawyer, uh, you don't really want to get on social media too much. At least that was the general view in my law firm in Washington. There certainly are some who do it, but you know, you, you kind of want to be a person in the background. You don't want to do anything that could cause uh, any kind of discomfort for your clients. Uh, it's very important to just kind of be behind the scenes. Uh, and so, you know, I really joined Twitter when President Trump was elected uh, because that became a critical source of news. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was really a, a consumer. I wasn't really a poster for the first few months. And then, um, you know, I, I got a couple of follow requests from friends and family and, and started putting up a few family pictures. I probably hadn't posted more than about 25 or 30 uh, things on Twitter uh, before I came to Mexico as ambassador. I remember when I uh, was confirmed, I uh, created a Twitter account called, I don't know, Chris Landau DC Mex or something. And I, I spoke to the people at the embassy and they said, oh no, don't do that. We don't want you to have a personal Twitter account that will dilute the, the message. We want you to use the official USAM Mex uh, Twitter account. So I said, okay, if that's what you want, you guys have thought about these issues and I don't want to get into trouble with what things I post where. And, and they said, you know, you can, uh, post what you like on the official account. I think that Martha and I are a little bit different on that because I think she has a Martha Barsena account and I have the US Amp Mex account. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I got here, I introduced myself and uh, you know, the first weekend I went to Xochimilco and posted that. And you know, in my private account, I, I had never had more than I think about 11 followers and most of whom were relatives of mine. Uh, and then all of a sudden I got, you know, 10,000 likes uh, for that uh, trip to Xochimilco with my family. And, you know, I, I had made a decision that, you know, I was going to introduce my family. I thought that it was a, it seemed like a valuable tool for making myself uh, visible to the Mexican public. Uh, and I was really taken aback with the reaction that it was very positive. And I said, wow, this is really a, a potentially powerful tool of communication. And I think, you know, people, it demystified a little bit the office of ambassador. I think people are not used to having direct contact with the ambassador, either with me or with Martha or any other ambassador. And I think people appreciate that. I think people have kind of wondered what, you know, what ambassadors really do. And so, you know, it just gets kind of taken off organically over, over the past year. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting because what the, both of you got into this question of kind of what content people want to see from ambassadors. And I think we actually want to bring the audience in on this question. Um, Andres or Angela, could you launch uh, the poll that we had related to this question of, of kind of as a follower, what 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 are you looking for uh, from ambassador tweets? Oh, Andres, you're muted. Oh, there we go. Angela warned us that would happen. Uh, yes. So the question is. Um... So we can do this poll too. Actually, I think that why don't we? Um, this is this is another interesting. Uh, Yes, I'm sorry. I launched the wrong one. Um, we can this is a more baseline question about uh, how representative do you feel Twitter is of of public opinion uh, writ large? Uh, it's sort of an uh, admittedly you know imprecise thing, but it's an interesting thing that people debate: is what you see on Twitter on your Twitter feed reflective of a, a more of a broader sense of public opinion. So uh, the um, we're seeing that most respondents think it's an imperfect approximation of public opinion, as opposed to being very accurate, that was 28% or a poor reflection, which was 10%. Um, let me go to the other question that uh, you mentioned, which is, um, 
in terms of content, in general, what would you like to see more of from ambassadorial tweets? Slice of life content uh, along the lines of what you are all discussing in terms of pictures of, of food, family, travel, sort of behind the scenes color, um, or detail on policy priorities, or the third answer would be service oriented information such as guidelines on visas or travel restrictions, uh, all kind of intersecting with your roles as an ambassador. So let me launch that. Um, give people a chance to, to answer. And certainly maybe this is a hard question to answer because it's, it's not all or nothing, right? I think exactly, both, yeah. of you, both of you have kind of combined all three of these things um, on, on your accounts, but exactly. I'm interested in what people think here. I'm yeah. very interested in this too. I mean, my, my operating assumption is that a successful account has all of these things in it. Uh, and that, you know, you, you don't want to be completely frivolous, but uh, on the other hand, I think, well, we'll see what the voters say. <laughs> uh, Here it is. Uh, so it's, uh, yes. people seem to want more detail on policy priorities, um, but it's, it's you know, there, there's there's demand too for, for the other, the slice of life and ser service oriented. And again, we're, we're stipulating that you all are, are already doing a balance of these things, but the question is posed is, what would you like to see more of? Um, so yes. yeah, it's interesting because, you know, my, I don't know that my Twitter, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I was gonna say, I, I don't know that my account, at least when I look at the likes and the interaction I get, it doesn't necessarily reflect that. I mean, sometimes the ones that are kind of on pure policy issues get the fewest uh, interaction by a lot, actually, it's somewhat surprising to me. Uh, I, you know, I still feel like you have to take a certain amount of the medicine <laughs> or something. But you know, I, I put up a picture of my dinner, and the the, the likes go through the roof. I don't want to just do that because I think you know the, 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 there there is an ultimate, more substantive goal here. But you know, it at least my experience is that that. The, 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 the interaction is much higher for the more, the lighter tweets. Sorry, Martha, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 it's perfect. I, I try to focus more on the details on policy priorities on my tweets, even if it's Marta Barcena, not Mexican ambassador to the US. And we were thinking even changing the name of, of the Twitter account to see if, if uh, uh, it would help to, to interact better with the, with the public. I tweet very little about this so-called slice of life. Uh, as I told you, I try to, I tend to be a very private person. So um, I'm very reluctant to tweet about that, but I understand that it's something that people are interested. And in the case of services, I tweet very little. Uh, I normally tweet about, you know, natural disasters. Now I have been tweeting about Delta, Hurricane and other, because we use for that the official accounts in Facebook, which we know reach more the Mexican community and the public that we want to, to deal with. That doesn't mean that I don't answer uh, services. People approach me through Twitter and said, Ambassador, we have this problem. So that helps me to interact with them. And sometimes they write me and say, and I think they are in DC and they are in Denver. So we, we contact them and then we put them in contact with our consulate in Denver to solve the problem. So um, we try to be very flexible in the managing of the different accounts of, uh, of the embassy and my personal accounts. Yes, yeah, so I want to dig into that um, interaction a little bit more. And I think, you know, one of the reasons that you both have found success on Twitter is um, by engaging um, with people, particularly um, in Esther Landau. I know um, that you get a lot of people tweeting at you, uh, asking questions about kind of visa and immigration policy. Um, Ambassador Barcena, I'm sure you, you get a lot of those requests as well, as you just mentioned. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's this question of when to engage with people. Um, um, as public figures, you're certainly going to get some substance-based criticism. You're also going to get um, some people who use platforms to perpetuate harassment and abuse. Um, particularly research shows, shows that women leaders are, are more um, likely to receive some of those negative and abusive messages on these platforms. Um, so Ambassador Barcena, I, I want, you know, as the first woman in your position, I want um, to know kind of 
how you have, how you handle uh, criticism, um, how you decide when to engage with people on Twitter, and um, just kind of how, how you balance those, um, you know, responding and giving information versus adding gasoline to a fire. Well, in general, I don't engage in fights. I, I received uh, criticism, providing that they are not insults. If there are insults, I immediately uh, send the message to Twitter that this is an abusive or harmful message, because I don't think we should stand uh, abuse or, or violence or threats or insults. But we should, uh, we should accept all kinds of criticism. Sometimes I answer and I said, my opinion is different, but thank you for sending me this message. Sometimes I just uh, think that I said, uh, I, I simply don't engage because I don't think it's worth it when, when it's insulting the message. So, uh, but uh, I think that in social media, sometimes what happens is that people loses all the quorum and it becomes very ideologized. And I think for a diplomat, we have to keep this decorum and the way we interact with others. And we should never uh, engage into uh, a match of insults. And um, so I, I try, that's why I try to keep to policy priorities and not engage in very much personal questions. And I give you an example. For the month of September, which is the national month of Mexico, we did something called Reto Mes Patrio. It was all the women ambassadors of Mexico abroad. And we, for a month, we were showing the different um, dresses, traditional dresses of Mexico. And, uh, and I changed my profile in Twitter, uh, dressed with one of the most beautiful dresses of Mexico, which is from Oaxaca, from Tehuantepec. It was a dress from my gran that I inherited from my grandmother. So I'm very proud of that. And I received a tweet saying, um, ridiculous old woman, you should dress like a diplomat, not like that. And I just think it's, it's, it's segregatious insult. I mean, I'm promoting the Mexican textiles, the Mexican culture. So uh, to those kind of messages, I never answer because it's not even worth it. Yeah. So, uh, but if they say you are not doing your job and you should do this, I try to say, why do you think for example, the other day there was a, a, an answer to saying you should engage more with the Mexican community in defining the priorities of the bilateral relationship. Say, so, okay, contact us and tell us in which way. And we would happily listen to you and engage with you. So it, it changes uh, on the way how you interact with the people depending on the, on the messages. And Ambassador Lando, I, I, I want to pose this question to you as well. I mean, you having become kind of a, a celebrity on, on Twitter in Mexico, get a lot of um, messages. Uh, you know, there are the messages in that category of visa and immigration uh, questions. Um, but there are also messages, I think I saw the other day, you know, someone calling you a sugar daddy. There are uh, people who uh, do respond criticizing of you for the way that you do your job. And so uh, take us into your thought process of how how you determine when to engage with someone and um, and in what tone. I like to read the responses I get to my tweets. Uh, I don't do it every single day. I mean, some days my schedule just doesn't permit it. Some days it does. You know, sometimes I'm in the car and I have a half hour ride. I say, you know, I'll look at Twitter. Uh, some nights, you know, it's, it's hard for me to fall asleep and I might do it then. I do it at all kinds of odd hours when I have a little bit of uh, time in my schedule. Obviously now with COVID, I think all of our schedules have been turned somewhat upside down and I've had probably more time now than I did in the pre-COVID time. But I actually think it's a very useful mechanism, not just for me to be saying what's on my mind on Twitter, but also to be hearing what other people, how other people react. I think, you know, sometimes when you're in a leadership position, uh, I think one of the biggest dangers is that you live in a bubble where people just tell you what you want to hear. And frankly, you know, the anonymity of Twitter lets people say what's on their mind with a great degree of frankness. And, you know, that can be good and that can be bad. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, it was very important for me to hear people's concerns about the student visas uh, which were delayed because of COVID and, and 
Um, you know, now I'm getting a lot of tweets about spousal visas. You know, these are issues that I wouldn't necessarily have people uh, coming up to me and, and saying, there's a problem with your services. I think the thing that I'm proudest about on Twitter is that we've created a mechanism where I can uh, refer a lot of these consular questions to our consular experts. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't take the time to answer every single consular question. And frankly, a lot of times, I don't know the answers. They get quite technical on consular things. But I think it's you know, an important service that we provide. Ultimately, we are here for a mission. And, and, and we are here, part of that mission is to provide uh, consular services to our own citizens here in Mexico and, and to uh, Mexican citizens as well. And uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to have kind of opened up a new channel of communication. A lot of that information is on our website somewhere, but that is not that easy always to navigate that website, uh, any website. I mean, sometimes, you know, the problem in our world now is that there's too much information out there. So if people have a, a specific human being that they can ask a question to, I think that's, you know, that's a nice thing. And it's nice to be able to respond. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I want to I wanna make sure that we leave plenty of time for audience questions because we have gotten um, very many questions, um, great questions from the audience. But I want to ask you both, um, just kind of as, as we're wrapping up here, I want you to look into the, into the future a bit for us. So uh, Twitter is uh, relatively new in the history of diplomacy. Digital diplomacy is a new and evolving field. And so um, if you think 5, 10, 20 years uh, into the future, um, what do you think think uh, diplomacy is going to look like in terms of uh, these online platforms? Are, are all ambassadors going to be tweeting? How are they going to be tweeting? Ambassador Barsana, what future do you see? Well, I think social media arrived to stay. And, and, and I think uh, it will become uh, the most relevant uh, part of the so-called public diplomacy. So uh, it will stay and we have to learn to better improve it and to use it for the best of the, to, to, to simply comply with the tasks that we have to do as ambassadors. For example, one of the most important elements that we have had during the pandemic was the use of social media. Uh, that the embassy compiled all the health, education, and welfare resources available for Mexicans in the U.S. that was done by each one of the consulates. And then we were tweeting constantly about it and, and redirecting the Mexicans to, to, to the web page of the embassy. So this was a very service-oriented use of social media. And I think that part of service-oriented use of social media is key. And uh, even if we think into, if we take into account that more and more even processes and bureaucratic processes will be done through digital media. So uh, that is one, one uh, key issue. The, the most important, I think, element to avoid in the future of the use of social media is uh, it's, uh, how do we deal with this polarization or disinformation that can go uh, you know, on, on social media and that you sometimes need to learn to discriminate this kind of disinformation. And this is particularly difficult in times, for example, of natural disasters, in time of social uprisings, in times of elections. And so how do you, because everybody will look to the social media of the embassy or the ambassador to say what they are, to see what they are saying, what we are saying. And this is key. So we will need to, to fight on, I think, first acknowledge that social media is here to stay. Second, which is the main challenge, which is the use of, uh, of social media for disinformation, for polarization. And third is to connect with, uh, it's the better part is to connect with wider audiences and to put the social media at the service of that audience that you are dealing with. And when I say the service is not only informing on consular services or the services of the embassy, 
but informing about your country, informing what you care about, informing what you are really working together for the future of the bilateral relationships, in this case with the US and or in uh, wherever you are, if you are in United Nations, where are your priorities in UN? So uh, in synthesis, that, that would be my, my three takes on the future. It's here to stay, avoid this information and polarization and use it for the best causes. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, those are uh, those are heavy responsibilities, um, but I, I think great great objectives to work toward. And Ambassador Landau, um, what is what is your take on on the future? Do you think more Twitter more ambassadors are going to embrace Twitter the way that you have, or or will you go down in history as? <laughs> he's a celebrity. He's not an ambassador. I am a humble ambassador. He's a celebrity. Well, look, I, I think as as Martha said very well. I think the world has moved to a place where a lot of people now get their information on social media for good or for ill. And I think it is important, given our role as communicators, to have a role in social media. I'll say, though, that I think for social media to work, it has to be authentic. And it has to reflect the personality of the particular person, at least when you have an individual account. Uh, as opposed to an institutional account, which is somewhat different. Uh, and, you know, and, and so I think each ambassador, it, it's going to, he or she is going to have a different uh, personality. And, you know, I think the one thing you really can't do on social media is fake it. Uh, I think people know right away if you are writing your tweets or if you're just basically, you know, tweeting something that somebody else is writing. And And I try to always uh, you know, write about things that are interesting to me personally, uh, or experiences that I have had. Uh, because I think, you know, that to me, I, I want people to understand that it's authentic. You know, in the first few months, I got a lot of questions saying, well, Mr. Ambassador, who handles your, who's your account manager? And I said, these 10 fingers are my account managers. And a lot of people didn't believe me. I think over time, maybe my tweets have gotten so eccentric and so personal that it's quite obvious that it's me. Um, but, but I think, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not for everybody. I think some people are very private and I totally respect that. I mean, I, I'm probably an outlier right now in terms of um, tweeting about my family and our experiences. But part of what I love about this job is getting out and seeing Mexico. And I think it's interesting for the people of a country to see a foreigner who's come to live in their country and, and see their own country through a foreigner's eyes. At least, you know, I, I, I think those are the tweets that I find that, you know, often get a good response. And it's something that I love to do. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I don't keep a diary in a sense that my, my Twitter account is, is my diary. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I, I guess some people are, are, you know, wouldn't necessarily want to share their diary with the whole world. Um, and, you know, when I arrived, I just decided I know family is important to, to Mexico. And, you know, that was the, 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 the kind of relationship I was prepared to, to, to have out there. And I think people have, you know, the numbers at least suggest that people have uh, enjoyed that relationship. And I certainly benefit a lot from it and value it. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Andres, I want to um, invite you to come in here with some of the audience questions. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to add on the last point that uh, Ambassador Lando was talking about, I, I did chuckle quite a bit when uh, uh, there were people on Twitter trying to nominate you to be Mexico's next uh, Secretario de Turismo. <laughs> your, your exuberant uh, travelogue posts that, that make uh, it, it, your, your appreciation for the country uh, comes through loud and clear. Um, we have a question here uh, this, that struck me as very interesting, and it's something that Ambassador Lando, you touched upon in uh, your discussion, what, the Future Tense article that we published. Uh, but the question from Irene Levy, or Irene Levy, uh, do you think countries or administrations may impose some rules to their functionaries in terms of what to do or not to do on Twitter? And I, uh, it, this reminded me. I think it. I think it was in the in the article where you said there's a there's you know there's a a process if you want to write an op-ed and reforma, and maybe not so much process if you want to say the same thing in Twitter. But maybe talk uh, both of you. Um, you know, are as people get 
more uh, of a sense of what the ground rules should be, um, might ambassadors in the future face restrictions that you currently don't, either one of you? Um, I can start out there because it's an issue that I've, I've talked about before, and, and you are correct. If an American ambassador wants to publish an op-ed in the newspaper, we have to send that back to Washington and has to be cleared, and that can take weeks. Uh, right now, there is no similar process for Twitter. So I, I kind of think that kind of a process wouldn't work for Twitter, given the very immediate nature of the medium. Um, and so I, I wonder, though, if we might be living in a moment of freedom right now, uh, that uh, it's a window that might close. And, you know, I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, but almost every time you have a certain freedom, there will be somebody who misuses that uh, freedom. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid that just given, you know, the way I, I've seen governments work, uh, you know, somebody will use it poorly and then there will be restrictions in place to address that uh, thing and that will kind of kill it for everyone. So I, I, don't, I don't take for granted at least that what we're seeing now and at least the freedom in our system where ambassadors are free to comment on Twitter uh, as they wish without clearing it with other people uh, will last forever. I, I, I kind of assume frankly that it won't. Thank you. No, I, I think that, you know, when you are, uh, if you recall the title of ambassadors before, it was Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary. So I suppose that when a government uh, appoints an ambassador, they are trusting their uh, his or her criteria and, and and the maturity to know what they are doing. That doesn't mean that you cannot commit mistakes. Right. Maybe uh, write something in a moment that you didn't think it uh, twice and you made that mistakes. But I think basically is when a government entrusts you with a post of an ambassadorship, it means that they are trusting you on how you are going to communicate. So that you shouldn't be cleared in principle for everything you want to publish and not even an op-ed. You see, because you are supposed to know what are the limits and the position of your government. Uh, uh, having said that, I think that um, just to try to elaborate a set of rules on how government officials should use social media or not is very complicated. Right. It's very, very complicated. And I think uh, for me personally, I think that freedom of expression it's above everything. And that doesn't mean that a public official can write anything they, it passes through its mind or his mind, because that is why you are a public official. You know, you are supposed to know the limits in which you are moving. So uh, I would say that the more freedom that we have, uh, the better. And the use of your own judgment and your own criteria, which I understand and I underline and I understand perfectly well that sometimes we make mistakes and what we can, uh, that what we write sometimes could be misunderstood. But, uh, but I think freedom is key for, for the success of social media. And, and if, if, we, if people know that there are very strict guidelines on how you interact in social media, they will simply uh, lose all trust in what you're saying or doing. Well, there's a, a, a question here that, that's sort of very on point, and maybe follow up from our, our good friend, um, Axel Cabrera. I assume this is the Axel Cabrera, a uh, friend of ours at Comexi. Um, he's asking, um, are the Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores and the State Department ready slash interested in implementing the tech ambassador figure such as Denmark's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has. Now, Axel's very nerdy on international relations. So <laughs> talking about- I don't know what he's talking about. So. Stuff I don't quite know. I know. Um, he was ambassador to Denmark, so I know what. Okay, so yeah, but I think part of what this is like, I would add on to that the question of, because of what we were talking about, like is if they're not gonna be, maybe there won't be guidelines or rules, but maybe training, like Twitter training could be part of, the training that any ambassador going out into the world should receive, maybe already does. But, but uh, Ambassador Barsana, please. Um, 
my understanding of the tech ambassador of Denmark is not really to, to, to do guidelines on social yeah. media. He's supposed to be going to Silicon Valley to see what are the opportunities and to interact ah. with the technology uh, environment in, in, in Denmark. And they do it because Denmark is a country of five and a half million people and they don't have many uh, consulates. Mexico has 50 consulates in the US, mm -hmm. among others, San Francisco, San Jose, this. So our consuls there, they keep all the follow up of what is going on on technology and innovation and interact with the, with the universities. Um, of course, uh, all foreign ministries have always had this figure of ambassadors at large for a very specific issue. It can be an ambassador at large for the, and we can always think of an ambassador at large for technology that should not be necessarily based in Silicon Valley as the Danish ambassador spends a lot of the time there, but basically to follow up the issues of technology and innovation. In that sense, if it is conceived an ambassador at large for technology and innovation, I think it's a very good idea because even focus on the foreign ministry, they could really go into sectors. I was just saying yesterday in another webinar that foreign policy should not be thought anymore only on a regional basis. What is your policy towards Europe or Latin America? But what is your policy towards the different issues and sectors? And we do it quite a lot in the multilateral arena, but not in the bilateral arena. Interesting. So yes, an ambassador for technology and innovation, yes. Uh, but not necessarily based now in the U.S. because we have Mexico, we have 50 consulates and they are doing their job. Yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because I, I, I know you, you both are very busy and we don't want to uh, extend beyond the hour. So with that in mind, I do want to conflate a number of questions and, and texts that I've gotten um, that go something to the, um, I'm saving, I guess, the best for last in a way. Um, one of the things that make both of your jobs very interesting, and I use the term diplomatically, <laughs> is that you are representing heads of state who are themselves um, uh, very uh, uh, determined to communicate very directly uh, and very pointedly in a way that is not necessarily always diplomatic or, or presidential, but obviously both in their ways, President Trump and President López Obrador have a very direct connection to people, the daily press conferences, the uh, big Twitter following, and there's there aren't many filters. And in some ways, these presidents, unlike perhaps some of their predecessors, are less in need of ambassadors, intermediaries, because they have that direct connection, uh, you know, whether you like or don't like whatever they happen to be saying at a given moment. How much do you both feel that you have to be that intermediary and, amb and ambassador for whatever the latest um, uh, provocative statement from, you know, your boss that's come out, you know, or do you just sort of stand aside and get out of the way and feel like, you know, they've got that and, and I'm going to be over here pursuing the, you know, his agenda, but in a different context. I mean, how much do you, are you reacting to, President Trump's last tweet or President Lopez Obrador's last uh, mañanera? Because again, that's a dynamic that maybe some of your predecessors didn't necessarily have when presidents were a little bit more behind the curtain or just uh, communicating in, the la in that less direct way. Um, Ambassador Landau, if you want to take that. You know, I, I certainly have been inspired by President Trump's use of Twitter to communicate directly with the people. Uh, I, I don't know that I would have been as active on Twitter had I not had a commander in chief who was using this same medium, uh, you know, I think in a very effective way. I think, you know, he might have changed the world forever in terms of uh, the, the Twitter use. Uh, or, or, you know, Twitter is one social media platform. There, there, there are obviously others. Um, you know, I, I don't feel it's my job to be uh, trying to analyze or interpret the president's tweets. I think that they stand on their own. And so I have my own uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, again, sometimes I'm, I, I have a very specific uh, message I want to get across. Sometimes it's more just interesting things that happen in my day. I mean, like this morning, I just 
uh, was you know reading on social media about the, the terrible hurricane in in uh, the Yucatan, and so I tweeted about that. I, I put numbers for American citizens to call if they're there. You know, it, it basically, for, for me at least, is pretty much uh, a kind of a stream of consciousness of what's on my day, uh, and you know, occasionally I'll, I'll do some bigger picture uh, tweets uh, on, on larger issues. Uh, again, I, I have not found those to be particularly rewarding. Those those tend to be, uh, you know, get get into more controversy. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to uh, be a, an edgy uh, Twitter account necessarily. Uh, you know, it, it, we kind of touched on this a moment ago, but when you, I think I've done I don't know 7,500 tweets in in over this year in Mexico. Um, it must be counting replies and everything in that. But you know you're bound in that to 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 say some things that some people take the wrong way, um, and you know that's that's part of it. I mean I think part of it this is something you always have to uh, learn in life, even when you're just talking orally. You know you can be very very careful about what you say, and every word is so carefully chosen. Or you can be a little bit more spontaneous, understanding that the risk of spontaneity is that you will misspeak sometimes, or you will say something you didn't quite mean. And I think for me, I suppose for everyone in public life, it's all about getting that proper balance because you don't necessarily want to be so buttoned down in everything you say that you just give a one word answer or, you know, I, I, I feel like I don't have anything to hide. I'm, I want to be very transparent. So I like to engage in a conversation. Again, I, I, at least for me, the way I strike the balance is saying, okay, one of the downsides of that is that I may ultimately, uh, you know, uh, say something that didn't quite come out the wrong way, but I'd rather fall on that side of the line as opposed to just being the kind of ambassador that that, that you never hear from and, and that kind of stays in his or her embassy. Again, but these, these are just constant issues that any public figure, I think, has to deal with. So, thank you. Thank you. And, and I think that we could continue to talk about uh, these issues for much longer, but I want to be respectful of both of your time. Thank you so much for joining us in this uh, Future Tense and Convergence Lab event. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us. Um, Future Tense holds virtual events like this every Wednesday at noon Eastern. Um, and Convergence Lab also holds uh, events about every month. So if you want to stay up to date on those events, you can follow uh, Future Tense on Twitter at Future Tense Now and uh, Convergence Lab at ASU underscore MX. Um, so thank you all so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you so Gracias. It was a great conversation.